The emergence of countless monsters across various parts of Japan has already begun, prompting the defense force to plan in anticipation of the approaching intense battle. On the other hand, it has also been revealed that Kikaru will inherit number four of the number's weapon, previously owned by her mother, Hikari. In this video, look forward to non-stop action, the reveal of other numbers weapon users, and much more. Let's get started. In the next scene, we move to a house where a mother and daughter, whom Kafka and Reno had rescued at the beginning of the story, are watching the news. It reports that it has been three months since the emergence of 17 separate unsolved cases believed to be caused by a kaiju. In a bizarre turn of events, there have been no documented kaiju emergences since then. As of today, it has been 46 days since they last saw a kaiju emerge. The mother expresses concern about the situation, likening it to the calm before the storm. Her daughter reassures her not to worry, confidently stating that even if kaiju number 9 were to appear, she is sure that Mr. Kaiju Man, referring to Kafka, will defeat it again. After that, we head to the Ariaki Maritime Base, on basement level 17, where they feel an earthquake. A scientist with black hair explains to another scientist that the cause is Narumi and Kikaru, who have been training in the power suit practice room for the past few days. This revelation prompts a comment from the other scientist about the sensation of training two individuals equipped with numbers weapons. The black-haired scientist agrees and mentions that the fate of their nation now hangs in the balance, and the largest joint training exercise should be happening currently at Dianai Daiba. We then move to the joint practice grounds of the 1st and 3rd Division, where they are firing cannons into the air. It turns out that they are focusing on the accuracy of their shooting to increase their chances of taking down superior foes. They are being coached by Eiji, who is instructing them to align their lines of fire and increase their piercing power. Meanwhile, Kafka and Hashina are shown, where Kafka demonstrates the progress of his training in troop-style hand-to-hand -hand combat and positions himself to test an attack developed by Yi Sao. Kafka punches a practice foam held by Hashina, and the strength of the impact is evident. Hashina staggers back slightly, and soon after, Kafka exclaims, asking if it wasn't a good shot because of the force, adding that he could feel it in his bones. Hashina throws the training foam back at Kafka and says they will switch roles. After throwing it, he punches it and easily knocks Kafka back. Hashina points out that Kafka is not yet at the level he imagines himself to be, and suggests they take a lunch break, while Kafka is visibly irritated and questions if that action was necessary. Annoyed, Kafka thinks to himself that he just needs to wait for the afternoon session, determined to make Hashina praise him. In the next scene, Kafka goes to the rooftop and upon arriving there, he is amazed by the view. While contemplating where to have his lonely gourmet lunch, he suddenly noticed someone next to him. It was Mina, eating her lunch alone. He also saw that there was free space on the bench next to hers, but he restrained himself from sitting next to her and eating beside their captain. As he was about to leave, Mina asked him where he was going, urging him not to be shy. While Mina continues eating, Kafka looked nervously at her. Soon after, Kafka sat on the adjacent bench, and just as he was about to speak to Mina, she abruptly asked if it wasn't very quiet there, which surprised him. She pointed out the people working, studying, playing, and living. She knew that it was nothing but the calm before the storm. But even so, while sitting there, she felt as if the kaiju were truly gone. Kafka remembered the times when they were younger, and he grinned at those memories, soon agreeing with Mina. Kafka's smile quickly faded when he realized he hadn't used formalities, at which Mina laughed and told him to let it go since it was just the two of them there. Kafka sighed with relief and commented that the days when no games were spoiled and no one's cat died were the kind of days he wished would never end. Mina recalled that back in the day, Kafka always used to run to her whenever an alarm sounded from another school building, and she commented that it was actually quite embarrassing, which shocked Kafka. Kafka scratched his head and agreed, but reasoned that since Mina was the vice-captain of the Kafka Corps, it was natural for him as the captain to worry about her. Mina agreed and explained that whether heading to the shelter or walking with other children to school, Kafka was always at the front, standing as captain for all of them. 
Even though he was also scared, he always smiled and reassured her, making her feel that even if a kaiju appeared, Kafka could handle it and alleviate her fears. Kafka asked Mina if she was serious, and said that he was one heck of a child back then, to which Mina replied that he hadn't changed and had indeed managed to save the Tachikawa base. Mina explained that Hashina had told her about Kafka's decision and that she had become stronger. She told Kafka that she no longer needed to hide behind him, so he no longer needed to bear the burden alone. She then pointed out that they both promised to eradicate all the kaiju together. They looked at each other and Kafka agreed. Kafka remembered number nine, which caused Mina to notice a change in his expression. Kafka forced a smile and agreed that they had both made that promise. Mina's smile faded and she tightened her grip on her food, then excused herself to return to her quarters. As soon as Mina closed the door, she thought to herself that Kafka really hadn't changed, including the smile he showed when he pushed himself too hard. After that, Mina went downstairs, leaving Kafka sitting alone on the bench. While sitting, Kafka wondered what would happen from that point on, and he also pondered whether he could defeat Monster Number 9. He remembered what he had told Mina before about who would become the cooler officer, and quickly dismissed his doubts, stating that he needed to defeat that monster for the future of their country. In the next scene, we move to Shinjuku Ward, in Kabukicho, where a woman is approached by two men asking if she is waiting for someone, and they also invite her to eat with whoever she is waiting for. The woman agrees, but as she turns around, she reveals her terrifying appearance while saying that it's perfect timing as she was just about to call her friends. The men are puzzled as the woman transforms, and soon she completes her transformation, revealing that she is the kaiju that appeared in Shibuya Ward, and seems to be impaling the people around her with a strange attack resembling webs. The creature screams, and appears to emit a strong signal. In the next scene, we see Toku in a tuxedo, appearing restless. Ikitaka and Mori calm him down, reminding him that the father of the bride should look dignified. It turns out his daughter is getting married, which is why he is nervous, and his daughter has just arrived. Mori points out that Toku, who raised his daughter alone while working in monster disposal, is about to see her get married, and advises him to escort her properly. The two leave Toku with his daughter, whose name is revealed to be Kieko. As Toku tears up, Kieko steps on his foot and asks why he is more nervous than she is, urging him to compose himself. It is revealed that Kieko was once a delinquent. Following this, the host announces the entrance of the bride, making Toku even more nervous. Kieko then calls out to Toku and thanks him for everything he has done for her, which helps him regain his composure. As the door opens, the crowd cheers for them, but during this sacred event, a giant kaiju suddenly appears through the glass window outside, startling Toku. The kaiju smashes the glass window and tries to force its way in. Soon, the emergency report center is flooded with reports of monsters, and the operators are overwhelmed when they see the sheer volume of alerts and reports coming in from around Tokyo. In Setagaya Ward, in Wakabayashi, the train tracks suddenly lift, and a multitude of monsters emerge, destroying the train pathway there. We then move near Mount Takao, in Hakiyoji City, where giant mole-like kaiju appear. As we reach Minato Ward, in Shiba Park 4th District, numerous insect-like monsters emerge, causing panic among the people. We return to the emergency report center, where they are at a loss on how to handle the overwhelming number of reports coming in, realizing it is too much for them to manage. At Kieko's wedding, there was a man leading them to an escape route, with Toku carrying Kieko's fiancé, Daiki, and telling him not to let go as he would treat him once they reached the shelter. He vowed not to let Daiki leave Kieko alone. As they ran towards the stairs leading to the shelter, the head of a monster suddenly appeared from the side, knocking those ahead of them away. Toku and others were also thrown aside, and while checking if Daiki was okay, he noticed that the kaiju was approaching his daughter. The monster stepped on Kieko's feet, causing her to scream in pain, while Toku tried to yell at the monster to get away from his daughter. Toku bit his hand to make it bleed and tried to use the blood to attract the monster to eat him instead. However, this did not work, and the monster bit his daughter. 
leaving Toku helpless and forced to watch the horrific scene unfold. As the monster was about to consume his daughter, Toku screamed in anger, pleading for the monster to eat him instead. Fortunately, Narumi arrived just in time and quickly sliced the kaiju's body before it could fully consume Kyeko. Stunned, Toku watched as a troop member caught Kyeko. Narumi immediately reported to their base that the first unit had arrived at the outbreak scene in Sumida Ward. Toku was tearful when they were rescued, and Narumi said they would move to the subjugation phase. He called Mina to check if the situation on their side was under control, to which Mina retorted not to be foolish and to focus on his own situation. Narumi acknowledged this and became serious, leading the entire defense force in subjugating the monsters in their respective areas. It was clear that the defense force was ready for the intense battle ahead, and their determination to defeat any kaiju they encountered was evident. Narumi had positioned all the units, and they began to take down the emerging kaiju. Toku was shocked to see Narumi surrounded by countless kaiju, expressing doubt that he could defeat so many monsters. A troop member escorted him and informed him that they needed to leave the area. Toku suggested that they provide backup for Narumi, but the troop member insisted they really needed to evacuate. Toku was confused, so it was explained to him that Narumi was wearing the number's weapon number one, and when equipped with that suit, he essentially became a monster with human skin. During those moments, the most dangerous thing in their immediate area was their commander, Narumi himself. The closed holes in Narumi's outfit opened, revealing eyes similar to his own. Upon activation, it seemed as if Narumi gained X-ray vision, seeing the innards of the monsters around him. In an instant, Narumi annihilated all the kaiju surrounding him with extraordinary speed. This caused a massive explosion, prompting Toku and others to quickly evacuate while Narumi asked Eiji about the situation in his area. Eiji reported that he had both good and bad news. The good news was that the first and third units were making great progress in securing evacuation centers faster than before, thanks to their spread of troops and increased number of dedicated routes. Narumi asked about the request for reinforcements to the divisions. Eiji pointed out that was the bad news, similar to what Sushira had said. We moved to Hyogo Prefecture, in Himeji City, where the commander of the 6th unit, Switcher of Hashina, comments while watching the situation. He noted that the defense forces were driving wedges around the entire country, so they would not send reinforcements up east in that state. One of his companions commented that they should ignore the reinforcement shenanigans and focus on protecting the newly renovated Himeji Castle, to which Sutra remarked that just thinking about it gave him a headache. He then promptly ordered his comrades to take action. Eiji added to Narumi that it was not only in Hyogo but also in Osaka, Sendai, and even Hakadadi were sending reports, with more likely on the way. Narumi clicked his tongue, asking if Eiji meant that this was happening nationwide. Eiji explained that based on their data, the monsters were targeting major cities, power plants, radio towers, government facilities, and transportation hubs. It seemed that the monsters were targeting sites and services relied upon by humans, clearly not behaving like typical monsters. Narumi commented that he truly felt that Kaiju No. 9 was behind all of this, and was slowly moving its pieces to checkmate the humans. Suddenly, Kurusu called both him and Eiji to report the latest developments. The troops were struggling to reroute the monsters within three major areas, the National Diet Building, Chofu Airport, and Oizumi Interchange. The situation at the National Diet Building was severe, where the troops were fighting a monster with an estimated resilience of 7.0. Eiji commented that the sheer number of monsters was pushing them back, and if this was the highest number of encounters they had experienced, it was no surprise. He said that there was no hope of receiving backup from other divisions. Narumi was asked what he thought they should do, to which he replied that of course they would eliminate the monsters, as they had long been preparing for this. He signaled to Eiji that it was time, and deployed something. We moved to the Ariaki coastal base in the northern area, where a senior scientist commented that it had been over a decade since they last used it, back when Hikari was the commander of the first unit. They were referring to numbers weapon number four. Keiji spoke with Isao, asking if he was watching, and commented that it felt like Hikari was with them again. 
we see Kikaru now wearing the suit made from number 4, which used to belong to her mother. Kikaru boarded the exclusive electromagnetic launch system and was notified that her vitals were stable and trajectory calculations were complete. In her mind, Kikaru thought that although her strength might not yet be sufficient to replace her mother, she was sure she would be a worthy master of that number's weapon. She again asked her mother to lend her strength and informed the higher-ups that she too would now take action to join the all-out battle against the multitude of kaiju. Here we see that the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th units are in the Northern Division, while the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th units are in the Eastern Division. The 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th units are in the Western Division, and the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th units are in the Southern Division. The countdown for Kikaru's launch began. Her launch was reportedly successful, and her internal pressure was within the tolerance range. She emerged from the pod he was in and immediately deployed her shield, ready for activation, while the uni organ of number 4 responded normally. As she soared mid-air, she activated the capabilities of the number 4 suit, and wings sprouted, further accelerating her flight. The monitors of the suit were amazed, confident that Kikaru would reach the subjugation area on time, while Keiji explained that it was the fastest numbers weapon they had and the only one capable of flight. This numbers weapon was the reason why Hikari had the highest number of subjugated monsters of any commander in history. Meanwhile, several troop members continued to fight the kaiju with a resilience of 7.0, when suddenly a command was issued for them to stop attacking. One troop member ordered the others to evacuate the area, announcing that she had arrived. The monster looked confused and soon after, Kikaru arrived and powerfully slashed its back with extraordinary strength. The other troop members were astonished and commented that this was the legacy of their deceased chief, Isao. Kikaru stood boldly, clad in her modern suit. Narumi commented that she had finally arrived and only had 10 minutes to control the area, calling her dim-witted apprentice. Kikaru performed her signature hair flip and replied that she only needed five minutes there, calling Narumi a pain in the ass mentor. One of the troop members instructed the entire platoon to move on to phase two, positioning them to cover Kikaru. While this troop member was still issuing orders, Kikaru had already charged at one of the kaiju, swiftly knocking it down with a single swing. The troop member was amazed at Kikora's speed, realizing that if they helped her with explosive bullets, they would only get in her way. He decided to instruct the other troop members to switch to freeze bullets and focus on disrupting the mobility of the monsters. The troop members immediately complied, and just as one of them was about to report that he had successfully frozen a kaiju, Kikaru quickly moved in and began pounding the monster in front of her. The troop member was astounded, while Kikaru continued her onslaught on the kaiju. She easily dodged their attacks due to her flight ability and quickly brought down more kaiju. The troop member was in awe and felt like they were watching a commander at work, unable to keep up with the backup. Keiji commented that Kikaru had inherited the power of her father and the mobility of her mother. He thought back to earlier when he had said that Kikaru was like Hikari, but admitted to Isao that he might have been wrong. Kikaru continued to take down monsters with extraordinary strength and speed and Keiji remarked that she had indeed inherited traits from both of her parents. Kurusu quickly reported to the other troop members that Kikaru had already taken down three targets and that the battle conditions in the area had improved. Narumi muttered, not bad, as Eiji explained that the national diet building area seemed under control. Just as he was about to ask about the situation at Chofu Airport, Mina interjected that she had made arrangements to handle that. A war copter arrived, carrying Okanaji, who reported that the structural assimilation was complete, and the monster muscle fibers and uni organs were functioning normally. She also confirmed that the vitals he was reading were stable and ready for synchronization. It turned out that the status she was monitoring was that of Hashina, who was outfitted in numbers weapon number 10, which they were activating. Number 10 spoke to Hashina, announcing that it was finally time for him to be unleashed in battle. Hashina sighed in irritation and retorted that he was in charge, so number 10 should not boss him around. Hashina called Okanaji, annoyed because his suit was talking and he found it distracting. 
Okanagi explained that this was the first ever sentient weapon, so achieving neural synchronization was challenging, thus establishing a verbal connection was necessary. She added that Hashina should remember it was only a prototype and, in her opinion, not yet ready for actual combat. Hashina fell silent for a moment, understanding Okanagi's point, but argued that if they wanted to stay one step ahead of number 9, it was a gamble they needed to take. Suddenly, number 10 commented that he might enjoy getting accustomed to Hashina, which annoyed Hashina who snapped back that it wasn't number 10's body to control. They hadn't even had a single successful full release during training due to number 10 acting on its own, which disrupted their synchronization. Hashina stressed that number 10 needed to follow his commands, and if they couldn't get it right, he would die and number 10 would be discarded as trash. Number 10 lifted their tail and acknowledged understanding, prompting them to move on. Number 10 created a hole in the war copter, and they slipped through it, shocking Okanagi while Hashina irritably said that Number 10 really didn't understand what he had said. Okanagi tried to stop them from charging in without a strategy, but as they fell to the ground, Number 10 shouted that entering a battle without such preparations was part of the thrill. Hashina and Number 10 landed on the ground, right in the middle of numerous insect-type kaiju, drawing all their attention. Okanagi and another male colleague supporting Hashina were terrified, noting that Hashina had landed in a monster-dense zone and reiterating that using the suit in the field was too risky. Hashina prepared himself, setting aside Number 10's disobedience, and declared that it was time to show who was really in control. Hashina unleashed his swords, and several kaiju charged at him. He noted that the left side was more vulnerable, so that was his target. However, as he prepared to charge, he and Number 10 disagreed on whether to go left or right, leading to a tug of war that halted them. Because of this, they nearly got hit by the attacking monsters, but luckily Hashina managed to dodge. Hashina was irritated with Number 10, explaining that they needed to target the most vulnerable area because it was just common sense. However, Number 10 countered, saying that common sense was boring and that they could easily flank from the right. Upon landing, Hashina was quickly approached from behind by another kaiju. As he was instructing Number 10 to target the legs and slice them from behind, Number 10 again objected, saying it wanted to see how strong the monster was and suggested they attack it straight on. This caused Hashina's body to stop again, and as a result, he was solidly hit by the kaiju. Okanagi and his team were concerned about this, and Hashina was knocked back into the hangar, with other kaiju following up on their attack, but fortunately, he managed to block all their attacks. Hashina became frustrated with Number 10, blaming it for their being surrounded, to which Number 10 just laughed and seemed even more pleased. Okanagi was uneasy about the severe lack of sync between Hashina and Number 10, noting that their neural synchronization wasn't functioning properly, causing their released force to drop from 51% to 41%, a level not even seen during training. Because of this, Okanagi decided to pull Hashina back and get him a regular suit, but Hashina was unable to move from his position due to being surrounded by many fast-moving kaiju. So, they decided to synchronize instead to take them down. The another assistant became even more worried when Hashina's released force dropped to 34%, and if it dropped further, Hashina would no longer be able to protect himself. Hashina spoke to Number 10, stating it was their last chance, so it had to follow his lead. Despite Hashina's negotiation, as he was explaining that they would use the planes as cover, Number 10 once again objected, instructing him not to retreat and to charge at them head-on. This caused a strain in Hashina's movements, which stopped him, and because of this, one kaiju found an opening to throw a plane at him. As he turned around, the plane hit him on his face, causing great concern for Okanagi. Okanagi's colleague noticed that they were still detecting vital signs from Number 10, indicating that Hashina was still alive. After the sprinklers were activated and the fire and smoke cleared, it turned out Hashina was okay. He commented that the monster had predicted his movements and had aimed the plane at him. Number 10 then boasted that it had hardened its armor just in time for that attack, which is why it was able to save Hashina with a snap decision. In anger, 
Hashina struck number 10 in the face, calling it an idiot and explaining that if it had listened to him earlier, they wouldn't have ended up in that situation. Hashina then paused, realizing something, and admitted that he was wrong to ask for cooperation from number 10. He questioned why he kept involving himself with stubborn, hard-headed idiots. He addressed number 10 and explained that as a weapon, not following orders was a fatal flaw, and at this rate, the higher-ups would likely discard it. However, he concluded that they couldn't afford to die there, so Hashina decided he would follow number 10's preferred actions instead, and his suit began to creak. Okanaji noted that their neural synchronization had started, and Hashina's released force was rising again. Number 10 grinned at this and commented that this was what it wanted. Hashina then declared that they would charge at the monster's head-on, and together they acknowledged they were following each other into a precarious situation. It seems this is the beginning of our unique duo demonstrating their true strength. Hashina's released force rose to 56%, the highest they had seen from number 10. Soon after, the monster in front of them charged, and they agreed to confront it head-on, easily slicing through its body. While contending with two more that approached them, Number 10 mused that he somewhat enjoyed battling weaker creatures simultaneously and didn't mind the lack of advantage in battle. Number 10 shouted with hype, asking Hashina if they could still destroy the monsters there even though they were at a disadvantage. He urged Hashina to keep charging, crushing, overpowering the enemies, and wiping out those monsters. That's how one should fight in a battle. When another kaiju charged at them, Number 10 ordered Hashina to let him act and he would tear apart the remaining monster. Hashina sheathed his swords, so Number 10 took over, but Hashina explained that it was too late by the time he said that. It turned out that Hashina had already sliced up the remaining monster in front of them. Hashina then said that didn't he tell Number 10 to follow him into the fire, where Number 10 irritably responded that it was the one who said that. Hashina's suit contracted again and he swiftly charged to clear the tarmac as well. He emerged from the hangar and charged at the kaiju outside, his released force increasing again to 67%. Number 10 felt strained, and when they encountered another monster, it tried to attack them, but Hashina easily sliced its claws and quickly used the Hashina-style blade-cutting technique second form. Cross Strike, which split the monster's body lengthwise and crosswise. Number 10 thought to himself how fast Hashina was. When two more kaiju charged at them, Hashina pointed out that they couldn't dodge them, so he instructed Number 10 to show if it could block the attacks of both on its own. Number 10 was invigorated by this, saying that he thought Hashina wouldn't let him do that. Using its tail, Number 10 easily stopped the back attack of the two kaiju and even destroyed their arms, which amazed Okanaji. Number 10 boasted to Hashina, but Hashina merely responded that he had seen better and suggested that next time Number 10 should try not to let them get hit by shrapnel. Okanaji was baffled as to why Hashina was teasing Number 10, fearing it might disrupt their synchronization. However, contrary to expectations, Hashina's teasing seemed to have the opposite effect on Number 10, as his released force increased again to 70%, which further puzzled Okanaji about how that was possible. Number 10 was annoyed with Hashina and retorted that the only reason there was any shrapnel left was because Hashina had failed to unleash his full power. Hashina became irritated and pointed out that their released force was already over 60%, and yet Number 10 was still struggling to block attacks from weaker creatures, and he still expected more from him. Number 10 became aggravated and challenged Hashina to charge again, so he could show what he was capable of. Okanaji couldn't explain the phenomenon because although the two were bickering, their released force was still rising. They spotted a black kaiju among the multitude, and Hashina suspected it was the leader of the monsters there. Hashina was ready to charge, so he challenged Number 10 to show what he could do and to deflect all incoming attacks from the monsters on him, to which Number 10 accepted the challenge. Hashina remarked that they were outright ignoring the creation of a strategy, and in fact, he wasn't used to that because it really wasn't his style. Confidently, Hashina prepared to charge at the monsters, and Number 10 prompted him to start running. Hashina dashed towards what they suspected was the boss of the kaiju, and his released force again increased, reaching 77%.
Hashina immediately used the first form of his technique, Empty Strike, to easily slice through the monster in front of him, while Number 10 managed to block another monster that was charging from behind. Hashina used the third form, Revenge Strike as a counterattack on the monster, followed up by Number 10's Tail Whip. Number 10 then told Hashina to admit that his action was perfect, to which Hashina responded not to brag as they were just getting started, and he didn't want any attacks to slip through their defense. Number 10 easily deflected the attacks of the surrounding monsters while Hashina walked forward, and Hashina felt a strange sensation because it seemed like the first time someone had cleared the way for him. Another monster appeared in front of him, but he easily sliced it. Hashina then got serious and said they would finish this, and clenched his entire body to use the sixth form of his technique, which made Number 10 shiver because he knew what that attack could do. Hashina clenched his entire body, and the strain was visible on his bodysuit, with Number 10 commenting that it felt like his muscles were being torn apart. He smiled while feeling an extraordinary power flowing through his entire body. Soon, Hashina caught up with the big boss of the kaiju, while Number 10 commented that he can get used to fighting with Hashina. In the end, Hashina used his sixth form, straight a strike on the monster, slicing through its body numerous times. Okanaji happily reported to others that the runway was secured, and only the terminal remained. We then moved near the Chofu Airport terminal, where, while some troop members were fighting, Okanaji reported to them that no monsters were detected inside the airport anymore. One of them commented that, of course, their vice commander had taken action there, and that the man was more savage than any monster. After taking down the boss in their area, Hashina said they would next hunt those outside, where suddenly Number 10 yelled at him, saying he was tired of the idiotic monsters they were fighting there, and that they would obliterate the troops. Hashina became angry at his remarks and clarified that those were their allies, to which Number 10 reasoned that he was bored with those monsters and wanted to fight someone else. Okanaji watched them as they continued to argue about what they should target next, leaving them speechless and commenting that this pair was chaotic, and some operators even called them a buddy comedy suit. On a serious note, Okanaji considered that Hashina's released force was at 77%, and he was gradually reaching his full released force when wearing a normal suit with that number's suit. If he could harness a released force that reached or exceeded 90%, no one could predict how powerful Hashina would be on the battlefield. Suddenly, Kurusu reported to the first unit about Hashina clearing the Chofu airport, causing Narumi to irritably imagine Hashina's boastful look because he finished earlier than them. Eiji then commented that only the Oizumi area remained, and Narumi asked who was in charge there. Kurusu explained that the area was managed by platoons led by Rin and Tachibana. Heavy traffic was slowing down the evacuation of residents there, but some troop members had been sent to assist, so their combat area was limited. However, the most pressing matter was the six colossal monsters in the area, which complicated their battle situation. While observing these monsters, Rin commented that there were too many of such creatures there, and that taking down just one of them would require a lot of firepower. He added that it was unprecedented to see six such large monsters emerging simultaneously in one area. Suddenly, someone called for Rin, requesting to be sent to the front lines. It turned out to be Kafka, who explained that he had never fought such large monsters before but was sure he would find a way. However, Rin did not allow Kafka to participate and insisted on keeping him in logistics, as he is their ace in the hole in their fight against Number 9. In Shinagawa, Number 9 emerged after sensing Kafka's partial transformation, and if he were to transform now, there's a chance that Number 9 could pinpoint his location. They are saving Kafka's deployment for the most vital phase. That is when it's time to subjugate Number 9. Just as Kafka was about to argue, Something happened to one of the colossal monsters there. Its belly seemed to swell. It was undergoing a structural transformation, and its internal temperature was rising. The colossal monster opened its mouth, and a powerful energy blast emerged, causing a massive explosion in the area. Kafka saw this and pondered how they would get out of this situation. Suddenly, someone told them they would handle it, positioned to the west-southwest. Kafka recognized the voice as belonging to Mina, 
who appeared to be wearing high-tech goggles connected to numerous wires. While Rin was thinking that she was currently in Tachikawa and surely couldn't take down the monster in their area, suddenly a powerful projectile hit one of the colossal kaiju, destroying its body. Rin was shocked by this sudden attack, and her and Kafka's eyes widened. She couldn't believe that Mina had hit the monster even though she was in Tachikawa, which was 20 kilometers away from their area. In Tachikawa, it was revealed that the extraordinary weapon was like a giant cannon mounted on the rooftop of a building, and it turns out it's a new weapon specialized for Mina, called the Colossal Monster Railgun. Mina ordered Karanos to reload the giant weapon, which was done promptly, and upon calculating, it showed that Mina's released force there was 94%. After reloading, Mina quickly fired another powerful projectile at another monster, and upon impact, it obliterated the body of the colossal kaiju, taking it down. Rin was amazed and disbelief was evident on her face, realizing the might and capability of the commander of the third unit. Everyone was astounded by Mina's strength, and Kafka was delighted by the appearance of their almighty colossal killer.